let's start the last session of uh, this today's uh, program and uh, we will have Bengt Holmström from Boston joining us. Bengt is the Paul Samuelson Professor of Economics Emeritus at MIT. He is best known for his theoretical research on contracts. He has made fundamental contributions to the theory of the firm, to corporate governance and to liquidity problems in financial crises. In 2016, Holmström was awarded the prize in economic sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel together with Oliver Hart. Holmström has served also in many non-academic roles. I want to mention his less known role in providing independent advice to the Finnish government. That work has started in 1992 when he was with Seppo Honkapohja, the key members in an expert group that prepared economic policy strategy for Finland after a deep recession in the early 90s. And his last contribution for policy was uh, in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic when he was part of an expert group that prepared a, a policy strategy for, for the pandemic, economic policy strategy on, under the pandemic. Uh, Holmstrom's results are often surprising, the research results. However, they are readily understandable and they have a sort of clear intuition and they are also, also based on realistic assumptions. I think we can wait also this time something surprising, something interesting, something exciting from Professor Holmstrom. Bengt Holmstrom, welcome to this workshop. This is last session of the, of, of, of the first day of this and, and uh, we are delighted to have you uh, present from, from Boston in, in this workshop. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marty. Uh, so, um, and thank you for inviting me to, to this conference. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased. I would have been even more pleased to be in person there, but uh, this is the reality today. I'm going to talk about a topic that I have uh, studied for for uh, since the great uh, financial crisis, 2007-2009. Uh, it was work that I started uh, started in those days, and uh, and uh, so some of you uh, probably have heard some version of this or, or, or something very similar. I apologize, but uh, I still think that for this audience, I checked that for this audience, this may be maybe containing new ideas. So that's what I'm presenting. And uh, and uh, basically, I'm going to lay out the, the, the reasons for the financial crisis and, and then finally come to to at the end, come to talk a little bit about the the effects it has uh, through digitalization on on emergency economies, how this perspective is affecting it. So uh, let me get. I I just have to. I don't know why it's not changing the page here. I'm a little bit unfamiliar with this uh, with this. Uh, Teams, we, we use Zooms. Can anybody there in the technical side say what I should be doing? It worked just fine when we tested it yesterday, but now it's not moving. Uh, if you uh, okay, try to, now I yes. see. I, I have to. I had to press. Uh, I I had to wake it up. Okay, thank you. So uh, let me start by the the crisis itself in two thousand. Uh, Eight when it broke out and and, and uh, people that was a shock because we had had 70 years of, of without a crisis so nobody even expected that in, in a developed world like uh, like uh, US and then subsequently in Europe that there could be a crisis so uh, the instant reaction to the causes of the crisis were many but uh, 
by and large, it was uh, the criticism fell on Wall Street and uh, and Wall Street greed and wrong incentives and securitization created complex, opaque uh, asset-backed securities that nobody really understood what was in the in the bags of, of chopped up small pieces of mortgages, and and then the ratings agencies get uh, got an earful and and uh, for having been careless. Uh, I often mention Michael Lewis, big, the big short, some some of you have seen the movie. He asked what I think is the key question, uh, he, he, and, uh, and that is that uh, how could Wall Street trade without knowing really anything or so very little? In his movie and his book, he, he lays down the fact that, that nobody, they kept trading on Wall Street, but very few people seem to know what these uh, different different, uh, very big sized uh, trades uh, uh, were worth. And, uh, and so the first instinct was to call for more transparency and, uh, and uh, so as to avoid this crisis. But uh, uh, I want to present an alternative view. I think that's the, the, the question is right. Why didn't Wall Street know anything? But basically I'm going to put forward an explanation why they didn't. And uh, and that is that in money markets, as these markets are, that is very short term debt, they are they are repo markets, they are they are short overnight uh, treasuries and, and, and treasury bills and, and so on. They are they are these very short term debts that get that get uh, rolled over frequently. Huge by the way, size of this market is uh, is many, many times larger in terms of of, of dollars than than say in the in the stock market. So stock market gets all the attention, but uh, but the, these money markets are gigantic and global. And so I'm putting forward the the notion that no questions asked is liquidity in money markets. That is, they were very liquid, and the only way they were liquid was that one didn't have to ask any questions. And the budget is a, it was an astute observer of of, of of uh, banks, he was a banking expert. Uh, he said already in the middle of the 19th century that every banker knows that if he has to prove he is worthy of credit, that is, if he, he if he has to become transparent, in fact, his credit is gone. So another way of putting it is that ignorance, ignorance that people don't know, they just don't have to ask questions, is almost bliss in money markets. And uh, that's uh, that's uh, the opposite. So it's not transparency is not going to solve the problem uh, in a way that people imagine. And um, and the problem here underlying this sort of view has to do with the fact that the stock market is is very dominant in this uh, in this uh, uh, in people's minds because the stock markets are exciting. All the all sorts of things happen in money markets when they are working well. Nothing really happens. And uh, people are very unaware of what, uh, what what's going on. So, so I'm going to make the thesis of one of the key theses I want to say is that uh, that uh, you know stock markets and money markets are very different, almost each other's opposites, and uh, therefore one should draw lessons from stock markets to deal with problems in the money markets. That's one of the main lessons. Uh, let me just say that uh, why isn't transparency important? Uh, so there is this sort of common, uh, common but false inference, and uh, that is that uh, that that somehow transparency will make us believe the same things. When in fact, very often it's just the opposite. So symmetric information about payoffs, that is the payoffs from the instruments, that's that's important for liquidity. That's everybody agrees on that. But transparency does not imply symmetric information. In fact, uh, in fact, it may, may be and often is the case that uh, if we make something transparent, then parties that watch that uh, same information actually start to believe something very different. So imagine that you put up, you are buying a car and you look at it from a long distance and there's a mechanic next to you that's bidding on the car also. So these, these are typical forms of bidding. Uh, then if you know that the mechanic has seen the service book and looked at the hood and driven the car, then you don't want to bid against him because uh, he knows a lot more. He understands what this means. 
But if you look at it from this long distance, which they usually do, that is, they, they, sometimes they just flash the car and then you have to bid. That makes the uninformed person about cars put him on the sa- in the same uh, position as the mechanic. So actually hiding information in cases of expertise, varying expertise, is, is very important. We process information so differently because we have different experiences. So there are two ways to symmetric information. Investors know everything of relevance, for instance, the stock prices or something like that. That's, that's what the stock market does in terms of getting symmetric information. But symmetric info ignorance uh, that you are going to get through over collateralized data, as I will show, that's, that's, a, that's an other, a much more common way of actually getting to symmetric information, especially in money markets. So these are the main theses. So why debt? You know, it's a good question because we get always in trouble. It, all financial crisis has to do with short-term debt, uh, sort of breaking down. So why, why are we at all playing with debt? And, and the short answer is debt is cheap. It's a cheap way of, of lending. And, and so this goes back all the way to Pawning, which is thousands of years old. The oldest uh, documents of Pawning are, are from China, you know, in the 600s uh, and so on. So, so what does, why is Pawning so efficient? And, and, and that is because it doesn't require very much information. And it especially doesn't require that we agree on the value of the pawn, that is the item that's being bought. So haggling over a price, if I try to sell something when I have a liquidity problem, then I then maybe maybe I value it more than, than Marty or anybody else, the pawn shop. But uh, all we have very different views about, you know, what, what this is. Maybe it's my grandfather's watch or something that has emotional value. So the solution to this problem of, of costly selling and haggling over the sale, sales price is a, this very clever solution that the pawn broker buys the pawn and he literally buys the pawn at a safe price for him. So, you know, if I think it's $500, the pawn broker may offer $50 or $100 or whatever. On one condition, I accept this trade, and that is that I'm given the right to buy back the pawn. So, so if you only offer me $100, then in a month, I will be able, want to be able to buy it at 105 or whatever the added, uh, added uh, interest rate is there. And the key point here is that this is all designed to avoid price discovery. This is the key. This is what makes debt so cheap and quick, is that, that it's a, there is no price discovery. The repo market is the world's biggest, most liquid market in a money market. And I'm talking about the US, but repo markets are elsewhere also. It is actually almost the same as the thousands of years old pawning. It's a little different in that in that it may be the pawn shop that wants to park money with somebody, uh, but uh, otherwise it's a modern day version of pawning and the basic logic is very similar. So uh, let me say a few words in a diff- looking at it a little differently, uh, the design of so debt is designed to be information insensitive. It's not just to overcome this problem of having to buy the, or having different information or valuation of a pawn. It's also the fact that when you look at broader areas, the, the, the market for debt, uh, in especially the short term market, then it won't, it's designed to be so that you don't have to ask any questions. And this is a picture for some, it's a, it means a lot, or is it simple? It's the red line is the payoff from, from, uh, from the, the collateral is placed uh, to support the value of debt. So there's a face value of debt, say 100, and there's collateral that uh, is worth more than 100 in order to secure the debt. Uh, and, uh, and the more you have collateral, the more you go to the right in the red, you know, in the red line goes to the right. That is the value of debt as a function of this collateral value at the time of, of, of expiration of this loan. So the red line is the market value of debt at, at expiration. Uh, and, and then the thin black line is market value of debt looking for, looking 
towards the end. That is, uh, if it's one month left to go, then then it's below this red line because it's an option. It may may go into default, and it eventually the more collateral you have, the more valuable the collateral is. Then eventually they tangent with the red line. So it it's one hundred. You know, if it's uh, if it's uh, the case that uh, there's a lot of collateral underneath it plenty more than the face value of debt. And that's the information in sensitive region. But if something happens and we get into closer, you know, the collateral value falls, as we will see shortly, then we get into the information insensitive region, information sensitive region. So that's the basic idea. Let me just mention that one of these things, this purposeful opacity, if you actually start thinking about this, you see that the bears sells uh, diamonds by by basically putting them in a bag, and you you are not allowed to look into the bag. Uh, so they get it makes it more liquid. And credit raises are, rates are coarse, and uh, money market funds uh, have delayed information release, and so on and so forth. So let me say what the pro problem with that is. I I'm, don't have that much time, so I can't elaborate on these things. There is a very dark side of that. And that is that relying on, on, on debt, on securitization, course ratings, mechanical rules for valuing this, the rating agents used very mechanical rules for, for valuing these uh, uh, securitized products, the ABSs and MBSs and so on. That all makes good sense in good times. But there is one concern about it. You, you don't remove any risk by making it more collateralized. The fundamental risk under it is it, it pushes risk into the tail. I should have not said that more collateral will, will reduce the risk, but it will push the risk into the tail when you make a debt contract. So you would make it very safe in the flat region when, when the, as we say, the debt is in the money, but if it ever goes into out of the money, that is, it goes into the red region and uh, uh, into the information sensitive region, then then it it is uh, it, it the risk gets bigger. So the social social trade off in some sense is everything that enhances liquidity uh, increases it, it increases the the it increases also the severity of tail risk. So you can get more of it. For instance, you can shorten the duration of the contract. That's going to make it more the region, the red region, or the, the information insensitive region larger. But it, if it ever goes into a crisis, then then it's going to cost you uh, a lot more. So one way of I'm going to have to jump over this uh, thing, but uh, one important thing if one asks what happened in the financial crisis is that what it was assumed that diversifying in debt markets, the in debt markets is a good thing. That's that's one burrows from the stock market, the idea that uh, that full diversification really makes this safe. It It's true that, uh, so here is an example that uh, if you have 10 identical, banks, each holding, say, one-tenth of the total portfolio of the debt portfolio of a country. So everybody has identical portfolios. They are fully diversified, just the way stock markets are, are the stock market advises. Then you realize that if every bank has exactly the same portfolio, a slice of the same portfolio, if one bank go down or its portfolio breaks the buck, so to speak, that is, it isn't fully valued, then everybody does it at the same time. So they are actually, the banks are perfectly correlated in, in this case. So this is an example of how the logic from the stock market has absolutely the opposite consequence. And Pre-crisis, people believed that even though debt levels kept increasing, they said, well, it's very well diversified. Actually, that, that's a disastrous thing on the whole for, for, for uh, if it goes you know, to a very extreme case. And this has been proven, exposed empirically, that actually this was a bit, big reason. Things were correlated uh, too much. So uh, 
I jump over this. It's this shift for informa- it's, it's when the distribution shifts from, from, uh, from information sensitive to information sensitive. Here you see, here you see one illustration of what it looks like. The, the, let me just say that the, the, when you, this is actual trading data from, from, uh, from uh, money markets. But it shows the left line is very stable. And, and these trades are just clustered around, exactly that, that is, they are all made roughly at the same price with small variations. But then uh, the, when the bear, bear fund collapsed in 2000, July 2007, so it was a, a year before the Lehman, or more than a year before the Lehman, you can see how there was total confusion in the market. And the prices just spread. Different parties bought with different, at different prices. They were not at all uniform, the prices. So, uh, so uh, this is an example of what happens when you end up in that tail where the money, when, when the debt is believed to not be any more worth 100, it's something less, but no, because there never was a price discovery of the tail, of the actual collateral value, people are totally confused about it. Here's another picture that you see. Uh, this, is, this is 2008. You see how how steeply, you know, the, they kept issuing more and more debt, you know, structural products and more debt. These are different varieties. I don't go into it. You just see that home equity loan is actually the biggest. So they, 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 this talk about, you know, the subprime loans, they played basically no role in this whole story. But this whole market dried up. Nothing was issued. And it's interesting to note that in money markets, you see, because there is no price discovery, it's always quantities that are just haircuts or, or, or in this case, you know, we don't issue anything more and so on. So, so again, this is very different than in the, in the stock market. Uh, so people were really puzzled that nothing traded for a while after the Lehman crisis. But how could we not find some price at which we can trade? And the answer is the adverse selection was so severe that, that you know, people had such different views about the prices. And they, they were afraid that others knew more than they did. So the summary of the view of, of, of this view that I presented is that uh, money markets and, and, and stock markets are two polar systems of liquidity provision. They are both liquid, but in very different ways liquid. In money markets, uh, uh, they are urgent, trillions of dollars of repo rolled over every day, in those days especially. Uh, it's Everything is information insensitive in the sense that there's no price discovery. Nobody knows anything expert-like really that is of value for trading. And there's just a shared understanding and it's trust-based. So it's a no questions asked environment. And that explains, that's the answer to Michael Lewis's question. Why didn't anybody ask any questions? The answer was because the market was working well. And that's the sign of a market working well. If somebody asks questions in money markets, they are already in trouble, just like Badgett uh, suggested. Stock markets are very different. You can wait for trade, Money markets, you have to trade, you know, you have to roll over these debts every day. So it's, it's if, if somebody stops trading like, you know, uh, JP Morgan did in, in the case of Lehman, it, it's just, a, it's a heart attack. And, and because you are thrown into the situation where you have to try to find out prices or start a market where there never was one price discovery market. It's information sensitive. So every, every piece of information matters. This very accurate and, and continuous price discovery. And it drives in some sense, it, what drives this market is that there is all the time information coming in and people have somewhat heterogeneous beliefs. So there's people that can make money on these trades. You don't make money on money markets because everybody believes the same. But when you have different beliefs, then you can make for short periods of time, you can make money. So this is what the stock market is. And here transparency is critical. Here, 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 every, even today, we are talking about nanoseconds mattering. In, in, and, and so it's a very intense, very expensive market relative to money markets. Money markets cost very little to run. 
that loans are made, these trillions of dollars of loans are made in, in, in snaps in very short periods of time without any information to stock market in order to get started, for instance, it really requires a lot of, of, if you want to do an IPO, you have to build a book, it takes months sometimes to do it and so on. So it's, it's an entirely different. Let me emphasize, money markets are very liquid because they are two-legged. That is, they so there is this pawn shop logic. So it's it's a it's what we call a a two leg market, and it's a primary market. The secondary market, when bonds, for instance, are issued, the, the, then you have to find the price because if you are trading bonds, that's a price discovery. You need to know exactly the price because it doesn't have that second leg, and and those markets are highly liquid. And in fact, most bonds are not traded at all. So uh, this is all to say that we need to understand. So this insight from the information view that I, I described is, is that uh, it answers the question, why didn't people ask questions in good times? Because that's the way it's supposed to work. Why ratings were caused? Because that puts up, that helps us have the same beliefs. If you if you start to provide detailed information, then experts become better than other experts. So you're hiding information. It also explains why it was so chaotic when eventually the market, money market funds uh, broke the buck. The role of government in crisis, it, uh, it has a very simple implication. Even at this level, you right away when you understand it, you understand that the key is to get back to the no questions asked state. You know, trying to sort of buy up toxic assets as the, the as the U.S. planned to do initially, uh, you know, with the seven hundred billion dollars that they get a pro get, got from Congress, it would have been a disaster because you would never have known whether all the toxic assets or sufficiently many toxic assets had been bought up. So they they abandoned that plan that they initially had and went into the idea of just recapitalize the, the core of the 19 banks, big banks, 80% of the banking system, recapitalize those banks. And there they were transparent for a while by showing that if we pour in this, I think it was less than $100 billion that eventually they put in, they said, that's enough to get us back into the no questions asked region. After that, it became more or less non-transparent again. So we have stress test uh, regulatory considerations are we have we got higher capital ratios, we got liquidity ratios, which I think are very questionable and partly a cause of the troubles we are seeing right now. So I'm not in favor. I won't go into it now. You can ask questions about it. But stress tests are very big in favor of. But I, I'm not sure these stresses should be as explicitly revealing as they are. Uh, that is, I think they should they should look like elevator tests. You know, there should be people coming repairing something, but they shouldn't put on the wall that you know. Last time we repaired it, you know, the, the, these these uh, these uh, cables were almost broken, and you know it could have fallen down and so on. You know, you don't reveal that. You just said it's fixed and it's good. So. Uh, so, and then the third thing to keep in mind is that transparency, if you want to reduce liquidity in, in money markets, then you can put in uh, information so that experts come in and that actually excludes a, a, a big bunch. And we saw it actually in the money market funds nowadays, they became they be, became more revealing after the, the Dodd-Frank uh, transformation. And just like this theory predicted, half of that half of the money markets uh, actually uh, ceased to exist as money markets. They became just uh, trading markets of different kinds. So their sort of money, moneyness disappeared. So let me say a few words about uh, the big data, because uh, I know both of your, your people who are, who are working in the area of, of emerging economies. And, and so uh, I'm very excited about the big data. It's an entirely new form of inclusive financing or, or financing. And, and it goes against the idea of, silent, you know, just putting collateral in. It's as I put it, you know, information is becoming the new collateral. So it's a very, it's reversing the idea that information is expensive and collateral is cheap. In the cases where we are trading on big platforms, 
uh, be, uh, and getting data sort of for free in some sense, then we can do some very different things. So the leader in this area, I think, is, is clear, and that's China. Uh, but many other developing markets have also, Africa has had, but China is really, in terms of volume and, and, and sophistication, it, it clearly leads, leads uh, the world. And, and, and the reason they are the leaders are, have to do with having been before, behind. They were, they were just, they never used checks. They didn't have uh, PCs, for instance, the computers, they went to mobile. Uh, internet almost directly for most people. They went from, from cash to actually paying with mobile phones directly. And so uh, this being behind has allowed them to leave for Western societies. So they are by far the most advanced in terms of payment systems. So these payment systems, which are brought from the platforms of Alibaba and, and, and WeChat uh, through their Alipay and WeChat Pay are the payment basically the main payment systems available in China. You can't go there with cash, you can't pay with cash anywhere. Even beggars uh, use Ali, Alipay and WeChat Pay. So the payment systems, everything gets recorded and there's massive amounts of data and upending the, tradi the traditional substitution uh, uh, that information is expensive. It's very cheap, it comes for free almost. So as I said, information is the new collateral. And, uh, and mobile credit is superior version of credit cards. So, so Alipay, for instance, they have, they have a, also a, a, a credit line. It's not that you apply for credit. So that's an interesting feature. You just get a message into your phone and asking, do you want to, do you want to increase your credit line, so to speak? That is, do you want to get yeah, we have we have evaluated you basically, and we have found that you are good credit. So so here is here, here is an offer to get credit. So it's it's not it's similar to the Western world, but uh, but you can't apply it at all, and and uh, and also everything happens electronically and without any human interaction at all. So it's called the three one zero system because it's a, it takes three minutes to deal with this message. It takes one second to get the, the, the money into your bank, and there's zero human involvement. And uh, one of the things uh, Alibaba uses as a slogan, they know you in the sense that you have, they have to know you in order to give you credit, but they don't know who you are. So it's, a, it's based on partly at least on the pseudonyms, which is a future that the West has uh, is to have started to explore the idea that that we have we have a, a second identity on the net that uh, that is uh, say a number or social security type number or something but uh, very few know who how the mapping from that number goes to our actual personal information so this is uh, addresses partly the, the concern about privacy the enforcement mechanism is very sophisticated and it's by the exclusion and continuous monitoring of fraud that's one thing but exclusion is very important because there are only two payment systems so if you somehow get excluded from the trading platforms you know it, a lot is taken away from you so so uh, there's very little fraud uh, in principle and and people people behave and they are these algorithms that evaluate people based on how they purchase things and what they are doing on the platform and how they are trading with each other, all the information is in some way used. Who are you? Who, who are your friends? Who are you dealing with? And so on. Sounds horrible, but actually it's very informative. Let me just mention that even if you just tell that do you have an iPhone versus an Android phone, uh, that already is informative in forecasting whether you will pay back your loan. So that has been tested in America. It's it's a little scary. And Android is, Android people uh, are poorer credit than than iPhone, and it has just to do with the with, with the prices. So these are dramatically lower costs, and and what I find most exciting is this has had a dramatic impact on on inclusive financing in China. I mean the the 200 million or or, or 300 million people that have brought out of poverty. This has played a role. This uh, this mobile internet has played a, a, a big role. And, and uh, if I may just say, Finland, uh, Nokia 
has done a lot in this domain. It's not talked about much in Finland, but but actually they were the, by far the leading leading uh, network provider and, and and mobile phone provider in the early days, and uh, had over fifty percent of market share in many many of the developing countries, Africa and India, and even forty percent in China. So uh, so. Uh, this is, I think, an enormously valuable thing. Let me mention, and I could talk about it a lot because I've been involved with, with Law and Academy in China uh, studying this. Uh, I just want to make mention of uh, uh, BCAS in Bangladesh uh, because uh, Bangladesh was very poor and and uh, and uh, this BCAS was, was uh, partly with the help of, of, of of, of uh, well, B B Cash was subsequently helped by investors like Alibaba, SoftBank, Bill Gates, IFC, and so on. So major investors have become excited about it. But it was established in 2011, so it's only 10 years roughly old, and it now has close to half of the Bangladeshian sort of addressable uh, public uh, customers. And of, of them, about half is active users. Active users means they use at least once a month uh, these accounts. So it's not just that they can buy things and so on. They also get banking services more generally. They get a bank account. Most people, absolutely the majority, had no bank accounts because they lived in villages and so on. So now they have, a, with their mobile phones, they have a bank account and, and uh, and they are using it, and they can buy products from far away. And uh, and again, I say China is far, far and away the most sophisticated and most uh, most uh, developed market. But uh, but Bangladesh is is you look at these numbers, they live well on 11 million transactions and yearly transfers, 40, 40 to 50 billion in inside Bangladesh. That's a lot of money for a relatively poor country. The Bangladesh. I think partly thanks to this, has recently surpassed India in GDP per capita. That's remarkable considering how poor it was uh, just uh, 20, 30 years ago. So, uh, so uh, Bcash is, is something that uh, you should be aware of. Uh, let me say that, uh, that uh, the key point here is that I think, let me see, I think there are enormous opportunities ahead. Uh, with, with this microfinance-based behavioral credit scoring that I have described, that you just watch what people do on the on the on the uh, these platforms, but various kinds of platforms, you know, what kind of insurance they buy or whatever they do, everything is followed. The point is that this is very reliable, first of all, in terms of forecasting how their credit scores are, and secondly, it's very scalable. That is, this is the remarkable thing. You can go, you know, the numbers in, in China are, 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 you know, way over half of Chinese population using mobile phones or have at least access to mobile phones. And, and, uh, and uh, India, you know, Bangladesh is coming behind, as you saw. Uh, and, and, and nothing like this has happened. If we look at the traditional micro, Microcredit, you know, where where you have these communi communities that you 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 lend to villages and and they monitor each other and therefore they are more reliable. They, it requires a lot of work to get it set up, and obviously a lot of human work. So it's important. It's it's just not very scalable, and it's also very spotty the results because you need to have skills, and uh, and. Uh, and under this author, some of you may have heard his, his idea of, of uh, creating new property rights for these poor people. That's just massively difficult to get registrations uh, to do that. So I think I think by far the best way, the future for, you know, eliminating poverty or reducing poverty and also getting, getting these unbanked people in the developing countries into the periphery of finance, which will bring the amount of poverty, is is uh, is this uh, this uh, system that I described here, this uh, behavioral credit scoring system. So uh, I don't want blockchain technologies going to 
I believe, going to make things a lot more secure as well. It's used a lot. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about that. But I think I stop here in terms of, of, of dealing. So I, I wanted to flag this. Now, it, this shows you that collateral can be reduced. Let me make one more point. Collateral is still very important. So this this sort of mobile mobile uh, finances uh, uh, mobile lending is is a, is not that big a share of it, but it's a very big share of the poor people's uh, purchases, and uh, and uh, it's coming actually to the U.S. also just because it's a lot more convenient than than uh, than uh, credit cards. The last point I, I, I think I have to make that j there is, is something that is part of my department in, at MIT and it was started about uh, in, in, in early 2000 and, and they have hundreds of these, uh, these uh, evaluations of this uh, behavioral credit scoring, uh, uh, scoring uh, efficiencies. Uh, and, uh, and uh, I think they are, they are pretty excited about this. Thank you very much. And, and uh, now questions from, from, from the workshop uh, participators. Uh, there's really two parts. Yes, please. Two parts. There's this, the general thing about information sensitivity and so on. And then there's this part on innovation or inclusive innovation, innovative, innovative finance. But yeah, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Armstrong. It was a very enlightening uh, experience for us. Okay. Um, I have kind of a two questions. Okay. First one is that, like, uh, say, um, in the in your uh, diagram, there is a kind of a default zone and there is a non-default zone depending on the value of the collateral, right? So now, um, so is, so if you kind of you know, in the pawn shop uh, example, suppose if I give some watch, so the watch is kind of a, a tangible object, it is kind of verifiable, but when actually in the actual transactions in the modern days, shadow banking and etc. So when the um, the kind of a, you know the instead of the tangible collateral, it became kind of a other financial assets, right? So which are which must be kind of backed on another uh, real asset, right? So isn't that kind of a, doesn't that create a kind of adverse selection? Sorry, I could be wrong. I mean, if I could understand you, that is in that zone, no non-information, I mean, in that default zone or what we call kind of a information sensitive zone, right? In the collateral, wouldn't that be a possibility of adverse selection in exchange? That's my first question. And my second question is that, how would you kind of relate to mobile banking in kind of a reducing the risk of uh, transaction to enable them, uh, enable lots of poorer people make an entry. So that part is kind of a little bit uh, not clear to me. Yes, Ben, please. So, uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify the picture. So you are exactly right, there's a, there's a there's an underlying value of collateral is on the horizontal axis and, and, and uh, initially we are far in the right side so that we, it is information insensitive because the collateral value is substantially over the, over the obligation to pay back debt. That is, if, if debt is 100, you know, the collateral value may be 150 or so. One of the key points is we don't have to have the same. No, it's, it's, we, we know there's enough collateral. That's the big sort of reduction in information. But if I asked, you know, what do you think the collateral is worth or I asked somebody else, we have very different valuations of the collateral. But none of that matters because, because variations in the collateral value and, and as it changes over the days and months, perhaps in this case, mostly days because these are short term days, then nothing happens to the, it, it's still 100. It's still well above the, uh, 
above the 100. So that's the point is that that's why this information is sensitive the region is not sensitive to changes or shocks to the value of collateral or even the people's valuations of collateral. So we don't have, we, we, we are sort of in disagreement if you asked us about the value of the collateral, but it doesn't matter for the value of the debt or, or the repayment the probability and therefore the value of the debt. So that's in the information insensitive. When in, information insensitive region, when we when collateral in in rare cases, but it as we saw it has happened, the collateral values start dropping, and and that's because that causes us to move to the left in the in the picture of debt, and we are coming then the thin black line eventually will disconnect from the red line, so it's no longer a hundred. But, you know, the let's call it the market value, though there's no market value on it, but they, conceptually, it's less that it's not worth any more hundred in the minds of people. And that's a moment, you know, that usually I do it smoothly, but usually you take a jump. Something unexpected happens, such as the Bear Stearns, uh, you know, default or somebody breaks the buck elsewhere in the money market fund or something. Those are very shocking events. And, and 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 then you are right, so we're getting to the adverse selection, then suddenly it matters that some people know different, we all know different things. So there's massive, we are going from a state of no questions asked, we are all on the same page, we're thinking about the same way in terms of the value of the of the debt, we are suddenly thrown into chaos because we are, we are, we are, we now realize that it's not a hundred, but what is it? And we have very different views and there's adverse selection. I'm not going to touch it because somebody knows more than I am. I'm not going to trade with anybody. And, and that's actually what happened in the United States. So they had no idea of, of, of what the value was suddenly. So did that answer your first question? So on the mobile banking, I think I, I will have to just defer that question to, to some other discussion. But uh, thank you for clearing, because I understood that is from the horizontal line, where his information is uh, insensitive, there actually doesn't really matter what is the value because already the loan is covered, right? So, but it is that the, actually you answered my query kind of very well, because when it becomes in the like the black zone, you know, your the black art zone, that is information sensitive yeah. zone. Yeah, there could be kind of a probably, you know, I mean, probably the market could be kind of a, you know, the market participant might invest in some information to a information acquisition or something like that could happen probably in that zone. I mean, in that zone, probably kind of some more uh, action could be happening where the information sensitive zone I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's. Yeah, but, yeah. but I'm, I'm telling you just the empirical fact, it is chaos most of the time. If it happens in a little place, you know, it, it, it takes, I mean, if we look at what happened in the, in the 2007-2009, the crisis really actually started 2007 already. So it was a year sort of simmering, but it was mostly in the over-the-counter market. Uh, and therefore nobody saw it. So it was still hidden, but those in the OTC market, they actually saw that something was happening and they get got increasing numbers and Bear Stones, got, the, the firm, you know, had to be rescued uh, by, by the Fed in, in March 2008 and so on. So there were kind of shocks, some of them rather significant, but as we saw, the, the government came in and rescued. So people, People felt comforted by that, but uh, so it doesn't have to completely collapse, but they will substantially reduce in value uh, initially in the OTC market. The collapse paradoxically came in the safest, supposedly the safest market, which was the tri-party market, because their adjustments to haircuts and such that took place in the OTC market, they didn't take place in the in the in the same way in the in the the tri-party market, because that, that was overseen, Those, that was more transparent and it was overseen by by these banks, you know, J, JP Morgan and, and, and Boney, as it's called, Bank of New York. Uh, and, uh, and so it was less abrupt, but then the Lehman collapse was a big enough event to get everybody thrown into chaos. And and after that, there was, you know, nobody really knew at all what, what, what the values would be because they couldn't see what change 
consequences it could have, contagion consequences it could have. And and it was immediately in the money market there was contagion. So they they you know basically the Fed had to come in and, and back up everything. It's a very chaotic time. I, I lived through it because I was actually involved with the New York Fed at the time. And and uh, there were days, the, the first day, you know, there were days where they didn't know whether the whole world would collapse. And this is a concern, by the way, today. I think the same situation, it, it's more transparent in some ways through the stress test and so on, but, but, but these discontinuities are in some sense always there because uh, because once the system starts collapsing everything feeds on everything else and 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 it it uh, tends to be tends to be very chaotic so i hope i hope nothing will happen and and uh, but i worry that uh, that central banks have used up their sort of gunpowder to defend against this crisis uh, in 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 several in several steps already, so they don't have as much left. Certainly, some countries won't have much left to pr protect their currencies and, and, and prevent crisis. And can you explain this sort of? I, I know that you have explained this. Uh, what happened in in the sovereign uh, debt market in Europe? How was the information sensitivity removed from the market uh, during the euro crisis? It may be yeah, so that, that, yeah, I, that's that's a fun fun case to see to see this sort of logic, information logic at work. The the, the EU situation in 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 you know the euro crisis 2000 uh, was it 2010 2012 or or, or so uh, that uh, that spread from the US to Europe. Uh, that you saw that the the spreads went up between the you know the 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 sovereign bonds you know had differential spreads uh, greece and greece was the main object of concern at the time and and the spreads kept growing and and uh, the response by the eu was to tell people that now we have you know 300 billion set aside to defend against this which by the way is much more than the us had they had only uh, then only used 100 billion but then they said well actually we have just increased it to 500 billion and eventually people started calculating that if we take all our sort of all our weapons in use uh, then we will have actually a whole trillion. Nothing of this really affected the, the spreads. You know, this this sort of explicit mention of how much more they had, it didn't do much good. And uh, one reason being that when you collapsed, sort of, it, it's it, 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 there's almost no amount of money enough to to cover everything. So so you know, a, bit, a trillion is a lot of money, but that's not enough to save all the European potential bankruptcy. So. So uh, then, then ev ev eventually, uh, you know, uh, they did they did stress tests also, and and they did, but they did stress tests. Uh, they took the first half of what the U.S. did, and they sort of explained what the bank. They studied the banks, and and, and you know, uh, and and they came up with a ridiculous number, like you know, oh, we need two billions to save the system. Or I don't remember what the number was, but I made it just a very small. And so people asked, well, uh, what do you mean? Did you test the Greece? And the answer was no, Greece we couldn't test because we don't know what is in the Greece, Greek banks, banks. And everybody said, oh my God, that's the only thing we are worried about is really Greece. And so then they opened up their books and showed that all the banks, including the Greece bank, Greek banks, you know, sort of what they knew about it and, and opened the book, so to speak. And and of course that that was a that in this theory that I have propounded that's the that's the last thing you should be doing when you approach a crisis opening the books because uh, then then you are really opening the door to adverse selection and so things got just mu much worse by that at that moment and and it was eventually Draghi that uh, resolved this whole thing by saying you know he only said that we will do whatever it takes and you better believe us and the spreads came down. And this was a very opaque statement. 
the assumption in the minds of people was it took all the experts. Experts can't put the sentence, whatever it takes, into a spreadsheet and start calculating. You know, no. So it brought sort of the, it took away the experts' expertise to some extent. And also it assured people that probably they had been talking with, with Germany and they were, there was, on it. but it was the opaqueness of the statement that we are, we are behind everything uh, was ultimately what resolved that crisis. Unfortunately, Europe hasn't used the time to really fix their banking system. Uh, it's, it's been 10 years since Draghi said that, and, and now we are again in, in sort of uncertain waters. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yeah, Kunal, please. Yeah, uh, Professor Hamzong is Kunal Sen from Univide. Um, I wanted to focus on the second part of your presentation. I completely agree with you. You're absolutely right. The microfinance, the government bank, the BRAC experience has simply not been replicable in other parts of the developing world. Uh, and partly, as you said, because of scalable problems. And I totally agree also that this new approach to microfinance, the big data approach, might well be the way forward. But I wanted to ask you that what can one learn from a Chinese experience with WePay and Alipay and the Bangladesh experience with BCAS for other low-income countries? What can governments do to try and do what exactly happened in China and also happens in Bangladesh uh, that you think uh, is important from a policy point of view? Thanks. Well, I think, I, think, I think what you learn is that these work on the whole pretty well. I mean, they, not, they are not working perfectly, and that's why this j uh, this uh, institute that does these randomized control trials that have been, become so popular, they are trying to study exactly what the effects are from, from, from these, uh, these systems. Uh, but, but, uh, but they work well enough. Indonesia is going there. They are, I mean, uh, uh, Indonesia has just started, started moving there. India is already having its own. I'm not that familiar with India, but India is having its own, you know, a version of BCAS, and I'm, I'm sure. So learning what they can learn from it is is basically see, Ali, you know, Alipay has shared with, with Bangladesh its information, with BCAS its information about they have invested there, and you know, they have, they have sort of described what they are doing. I'm not private to knowing what other, you know, parties have shared information. But uh, but it's not it's not like uh, you, you can sort of these are automated systems these are computer systems I mean they are they are as I said very scalable also in the sense of transportable uh, whereas we know that microfinance for instance of the old variety that Mohammed Yunus was using and 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 that was very valuable and still plays a valuable role but it's just small scale because it takes so. It's very spotty. Some communities say it works well, some communities it doesn't work well. You go to another nation, it doesn't work at all well. So you, you don't know how it works, whereas it seems like this, uh, this uh, computerized systems, which are based not on interviewing people or anything like that. You just look at what, how people are behaving on this. And and uh, and by the way, my my colleagues uh, Abhijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, who who won the Nobel Prize in 2019, uh, uh, for this book on 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 the JPL and and you know these uh, randomized control trials, uh, they they. Uh, they are enthusiastic also about this and and uh, and. Uh, agree that, you know, it, it's sort of much more robust and much more transportable than, uh, and, and they, they point, one of the points, I don't know if you have read the book, Poor Economics, is that poor people are very astute. We have, we, we Westerners uh, and, 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 you know, people in, in rich countries think the poor people are just lying, lying in the streets and they can't calculate anything. And keep they are actually, if you go a little bit about that, um, that total misery, you see that, that uh, the people who are really economists in this world or behaving like economically sophisticated people are the poor people. You see, it, for instance, that they are paying, you know, for mobile phones. Even even there's everybody has mobile phones in America. Even the homeless here, and and it's, it's, there's nobody anymore without a mobile phone because it's so valuable. 
and and uh, with that base you know as, as the, the tool of connecting is in your pocket all the time that makes an enormous difference and 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 the bangladeshians incidentally learn to read people didn't understand what, what, what who are they going to call and how are they going to call when they can't even read and write it turns out that it worked in the reverse when they got these phones originally in bangladesh which also was involved the, the this um, career family was involved in that uh, that was an enormous impulse to learning to read. So there are other effects coming from this that have been very beneficial for, for in my understanding. I, I'm speaking to people who know a lot more about poverty than I do, so I'm, I'm a little hesitant, but I have followed this, this particular, this mobile phone arm, both as, a, as a, when I was on, on the Nokia board and, and then, uh, then later with the Lowen Academy in China. Thank you. All right. If there's no other questions, we thank Bengt Thornstrom very much for this very informative uh, presentation and, and discussion. And, and thank you for all, all for the, those questions. And, and the session is closed. And uh, I suppose dinner is at seven. So thank you. Thank very you much. very much. Yeah.